Hey guys, my name is Alex Greenfield and today we're going to be making a stained glass window. I'm going to go through all the steps and all the materials needed to get your project started. Let's go. The first and most important step in any stained glass project is having a proper pattern. You can find these online or draw them yourselves. An example of a pattern that I found online was this one from glasspatterns.com. This would be a perfect thing to print out and follow along with this video. The project I'm working on today is actually for a customer, so I hand drew the image and I'll be using that pattern for this video. One of the first questions that arise when you're working on your stained glass project is what's your work surface? Well, this is it. This is called Homosote. You can get this at any big box store. It ranges from $25 to $30. It comes in a 4x8 sheet, so it might be kind of tricky to put in your cart. So I'm going to give you a quick demonstration on how to cut this down. You can do it in the store and when you get home so you can have the right size for your project. So here's my pattern. It's about 28 inches by 30 inches. When I cut this Homosote board, I'm going to want to leave a perimeter around my pattern. I'll show you why in a little bit. And I'm also going to leave a space over here so that I can cut my glass on it. So cutting the homosote is very easy. It's actually the same concept as cutting glass. All you do is score it and break it. Let's get started. With a little bit of luck. Perfect. We're almost ready to start cutting the glass. The last step we have to do is set up a blocking system. This is two rails that go across the top and the side of your stained glass. You can purchase online a layout blocking system and they range from $30 to $50. I never found a purpose for it. I use trim from Home Depot or Lowe's. It works just as well and it costs a fraction of the price. All right, I know some of you guys are watching this video saying, why didn't you use an official layout blocking system? If you have a good reason why I should get one, leave it in the comments and I'll look it up. Okay, so let's get started. I'm gonna attach my pattern to the board, and then I'm actually gonna use a right angle. You could even use a picture frame or a book, something that's square, and I'm gonna set it down and trace my lines. And that way, I'll be able to set my blocking system on the lines, staple it down, and we'll be ready to start cutting the glass. An easy way to keep your railing in place while you nail it in is to simply use some super glue. Glue it on, stick it down so it stays in place, and then when you nail it, it won't shift. All right, I'm really excited. It's finally time to cut some glass. I'm gonna show you a list of tools and I'll explain their functions as we go. Let's go kick some glass. The first tool we're gonna to adjust today are pattern shears. These are special scissors with two blades on the bottom and one on top. What this does is it cuts out a strip of paper which allows space for the foil taping. All you have to do is use them like regular pair of scissors and you just follow the line that you're cutting, keeping this in the center, and it will extract this black line. Now we have our pattern piece cut out. Make sure all your pieces are numbered so you don't end up with a glass jigsaw puzzle. The next step is gluing our pattern onto our piece of glass. You want to make sure that when you glue it on, you glue it onto the proper side. One side of glass generally is smooth, and the other one has a bit more texture. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter what side. When you glue on your pattern, you want to make sure that it's also facing the right direction. This side has more of a reflective side, and then the back is more matte. Alright, so I want this to be in the front, so when I glue on my pattern, I want to make sure that the shape's correct. Now I have to pick the location of my piece where I'm going to cut out of the glass. If I look at this texture, it goes vertical. I'm going to turn it so that it's horizontal. This way it matches the flow of my water better. Now that I found the right location for my pattern on my glass, I'm going to glue it down, just with a simple glue stick. Now it's time to talk glass cutters. This is the one I use. It's a pencil grip glass cutter. It has a chamber inside for oil, and you hold it like a pencil. They have other types such as a pistol grip, which you hold like this and the blade comes down. I don't prefer that. Some people with arthritis say it's easier to use. You know, put in the comments below and we'll find out who likes what. So this right. glass cutter is kind of like a mini pizza wheel with oil in it. There's a small round disc right up there that you rub against the glass and it scores the glass. What it does is it breaks the surface tension. Once it breaks the surface tension, all you have to do is snap the glass and it comes apart. It's very easy. The key when cutting the glass is not to push too hard or not to push too softly. You can generally tell if you push too hard, it creates chips, and if you push too softly, you won't see anything. So 
So I just made my score and now I need to do my running pliers. All right, these are running pliers. What they do is they have a curved jaw on the top and a flat jaw on the bottom. What happens is that curved jaw will push down on both sides of the crack and it will split the glass. Look at that, beautiful. I have a scrap of glass here. I'll show you the characteristics of the glass. Something that's interesting is when you're making a cut, you have to continue your cut, meaning you can't stop halfway and then make a turn. You have to continue your cut straight. All right, so if you want to make a curved piece like this, and let's say this would be the piece you want to keep, you would actually have to continue your curve all the way off, and then you'd have to cut the glass again down this way, and that's how you would get your piece. Obviously, if this is a right angle, you would move your piece over here so that you wouldn't have this waste. I'll be making two cuts. The first one I'm going to do is going to be incorrect. It's going to actually be too hard. Hopefully in the camera you'll be able to see it will chip up and it won't work properly. All right, so I hold it like a pencil. You can either go forward or backwards, however you want it. I'm going to go forward. Make sure when you start your cut, you start at the edge of the glass and work all the way to the other side. One continuous cut. This is going to be extra hard. Alright, if you heard it, it just sounds like poppy and like uh, it's cracking. It should still be able to break. You can break it with your hand, but this is pretty narrow, so I don't want it to, um, what's it called? Cut my hand. So it still worked, but you have like a nasty jagged edge. The proper strength for it a little bit softer. It sounds a little bit different, but that's how you do it. And then you line up your pliers. I'll show you in depth. Another way to break glass is to simply break it with your hands. Obviously, if it's small, you want to be careful and use a tool so you don't cut yourself. The easiest way to break it is just to imagine you're breaking a piece of chocolate. I pre-scored the line and then marked it so that you can see where the break is. Hold it like this tight and just snap it apart. These are called grozing pliers. These are for nibbing and extracting small pieces of glass off your pattern piece. If you look closely, there's a curved side of the jaw and a flat side of the jaw. And inside are small teeth that are used to file down the glass when you nib. All right, here's a good example of how to use nibs, your nibbing pliers. Basically, I'm gonna to try to clean out this edge along the, uh, the pattern. I'm gonna have my curved jaw up and hold the piece like this. I'm wearing glasses, safety goggles. All right, and then you just kind of break the pieces away. Kind of lift up like that and you just kind of rub the glass against the jaws. Just like that. So to pull this small piece off, I could just use my grozing pliers. All right, I'll use the flat side up, the flat side jaw up. You get up right to the line. I already scored it. Now all you have to do is pull and it comes right off. And then I'll clean this up just with my pliers. I'm doing this over a trash can because uh, it'll take you about two seconds to realize how messy this is. There you go. So you can watch as many YouTube videos as you like. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to pick up your own technique. And these, these type of tools, they just, they just get some getting used to. And you learn the glass. I mean, every glass has a little bit different characteristics, too. If there's thick spots or thin spots, it causes your crack to run in weird ways. I usually get my glass at a, uh, it's called Rainbow Art Glass. We used to live near New Jersey, but we just moved. So now I'm resorting to uh, Hobby Lobby. It's kind of a sin. Um, they have decent stuff, but you know, nothing like this handmade stuff that I used to get. Roughly the same price too, which is even more shameful. Okay, for this same thing, I'm just gonna Use my pliers, clean it out. 
See, now, like, I was using the flat side, but I just feel like this amount of lip would be better with the round side. So I, I switch around. I know somebody's going to freak out and write in the comments that I'm using them upside down, but it's preference. Whatever works, works. You'd be amazed how accurate you can get with these things. So I've been cutting all my pieces out, and I wasn't happy. This was made of two separate pieces, and I wasn't happy the way it looked and I want to turn it into one piece, so I'm going to show you how to adjust your pattern. Then you take a piece of scrap paper and you slide it underneath all your pieces. Once you have your paper underneath your pattern, take a fine point marker and you can actually just trace. This technique can be used to manipulate pieces if you accidentally cut a big piece and it cracked off a tiny bit and you want to just readjust your pieces so that your next piece will accommodate the gap where the crack was. Um, this is a good technique to use. I use it all the time. And there's your piece. So I want to address grinders. They are not necessary but extremely useful and I would almost consider them necessary. You hear a lot of people saying, oh, I've been cutting glass for 30 years and I've never needed a grinder. And they're like my age, so <laughs> I don't know. But uh, they're extremely useful tools and they help a lot. They can be abused and you don't want to abuse them. What I mean by that is you don't want to use them to take away too much glass. It's basically just meant to clean up your piece. If you look at this piece, it's basically right onto the pattern, but there are some jagged edges. Also over here, it's like a very fragile piece, so I don't want to nib that too much. So that's what I'm going to use the grinder for. Also, what's good about the grinder is it will make a perfectly smooth edge, where right now this is uh, quite bumpy. And so what that will do is it will allow the tape to adhere better and your pieces to fit in. After I cut each piece, I will run my piece around the grinder just softly to knock off any of the sharp edges so I don't end up cutting myself. Just keep in mind, when you use your grinder, it's a tool, not a crutch. This is a basic grinder, you fill it with water and then the sponge will soak up the water and it cools the blade as it spins and grinds. I really like grinders for parts like these where it's very fine and I'm afraid that I'll break off the piece. So you can get right down to the pattern. Alright, and there's an edge that's been properly ground, just nice and smooth, if you have anything that can cut you. So this is going to be a really fun pattern piece to cut out. I say that sarcastically. Um, there's a concave piece here, and then there's also this very fine point, um, which is actually necessary, so I can't let that break off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a little bit of extra glass on the outside, and that's a perfect time when I'm going to use my grinder. Uh, just to finesse it so I don't break that tip off. For this concave angle, it's not so deep, but all I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do a series of, here I'll do two cuts. I'll do one right along the pattern line and one a little bit shallower so I can pop them out. If this is deeper, you just do a few more relief cuts and then you, you take each section out one at a time. My fingers underneath putting pressure, it's a fulcrum, underneath the, uh, the crack and I'm just going to pull out like that and it should just come right out. Slowly just work the crack, pops right out. Now for this tip I'm going to be extra careful with my luck, I'm going to break it. So before I cut this, I could score it here or here first. I'm actually going to score it here first because this is more of a difficult cut. So that way there's more strength behind this narrow piece. You just always have to think about how you're going to approach your cuts. The piece that I just pulled off for that concave curve, this is why I did this side first, because if this was gone, there's a very good chance it would have snapped off my tip. I also want to take into consideration now, when I take off my tip, 
this is super fragile. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave a little bit of space of glass a little bit wider just to help me a tiny bit. And then I'm going to clean it up on the grinder. That way I don't have any risk of snapping off the tip. I'm also going to break it from the tip side this way so that the glass, if it's going to run, it's, it's going to run in this direction instead of coming towards my tip where there's a weaker point. There we go. Just broke it off. My wife is laughing upstairs because I keep messing up my line. As you can see, there's a lot of techniques in cutting glass. All you have to do is practice and your project will come out perfect. So we're up to my favorite step in the stained glass process, the foil taping. And if you wonder why it's my favorite step, it doesn't involve cutting yourself and you get to drink beer and watch the Three Stooges. Let's get started. So what we're gonna do in this step is we're gonna take our piece of glass and we're gonna wrap it with foil tape. This way our solder will adhere properly. What you'll need is your copper foil tape, an X-Acto knife, and a burnishing tool. This can actually be a stained glass burnishing tool or you can even use a pen cap, whatever works for you. So I have a fancy foiler and I'll show you how it works. I would recommend getting one if you have big projects with two or three hundred pieces because it saves you about 30 to 45 seconds per piece and that adds up quite fast. Before you foil tape any of your glass, you want to make sure that you wipe down all the edges with a damp rag to get off any glass dust so it doesn't prevent any of the adhesion of the tape. This box functions as a tape dispenser. For your foil tape, there's a paper backing and then the foil itself. And then the adhesive side is in between the paper. It peels off quite easily. For foiling by hand, I found the easiest way is to look vertically down and try to center your piece as best as possible. You don't want one side to be larger than the other because it will show through the glass, especially if you're using cathedral glass. So what you do is you press it down, and I'll even pinch the sides a little bit when I first start, and then I'm looking vertically down at my piece. Just trying to split it. What I found easy is when you have a straight edge, if you lay it on the table and pull, then you can just line your piece right in the middle and it automatically centers it. Make sure when you tear your tape that there's roughly a quarter of an inch overlap. If you accidentally tear your tape halfway through a piece, just overlap a quarter of an inch and continue your piece. To burnish your piece, all you have to do is rub down the edges going inwards. You don't want to peel the tape off. So you just go around and smooth out. This way it will seal off and prevent any flux from entering inside the glass in between the tape. I know there's some people who say it's not necessary to burnish the edges of your glass, but I like to do it anyways really quick. Run it through. There you have it. In general, there are three widths of foil tape. There's three sixteenths, seven thirty seconds, and a quarter of an inch. I generally go with seven thirty seconds. I'll use a quarter inch if I'm working with very thick glass. I plan on using a black patina on my solder, so I'm using a black backed foil tape. If you want to leave your solder silver, I'd recommend using a silver backed tape. And if you want to make it copper, use a copper backed. Whenever I look at a stained glass project of someone's, the first thing I do is look at the soldering line. This generally tells me the skill set. So if you're first starting, I would recommend going with the 730 seconds because it leaves a narrow strip and the soldering is much easier. Once you get to larger spaces, it's harder to keep a consistent bead. So this is my Glaster stained glass foiler. It took me a few years to get it and I wish I got it sooner. Basically, it dispenses your tape and it will split the paper and then it comes through this front this lifts up and there's a track here and there's grooves underneath which will align your glass perfectly on the center of the tape so you can run through large pieces very quickly. This saves a tremendous amount of time and it's only about $50. So on even one to two projects I find it justifiable. If you, uh, if you can afford it, I'd recommend getting one. I'll show you how it works. Normally I have this mounted to my workbench but for the sake of the video I have it sitting on my table. Once you wipe the dust off your glass, all you have to do is put it in this groove and you spin it. They claim that it burnishes the edges, but it does a very poor job, so you do have to go over and make sure that it's nice and tight. And 
then you can tear it. I usually have scissors, so I don't touch it, but they're not next to me. And there you go. You just burnish the edges, and you're ready to rock. In your window, you definitely want gaps, because this allows the solder to melt in between. But sometimes the gaps are too large. For example, this spot right here, this is quite a large gap. If I were to fill that with solder, chances are it would just leach through on the other side when it melts. So I'm going to show you how to fill that. The first option to fill your gaps is to use copper restrip. This is a flat wire that you put in between your glass pieces to actually reinforce your window. However, I don't like to use this because the width of this is a little too high and it stands proud of the window, so you'll see a bump. The next option is to use your copper foiling tape. All you have to do is peel off the back, stick it together, and fit it in the hole. My preferred method is to actually use copper wire, roughly 20 gauge. This is actually electrical wire, so there's multiple strands. I actually cut this out of an old washing machine that broke, and I had it in mind to use for this project. You can use solid copper wire as well. Personally, I like using the electrical wire because when you twist it, there's still space which allows the solder to adhere in between the fibers. So to fill this gap, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my wire and twist it so the fibers are tight. It's the same process if you're using the restrip or the copper foil. Just cut it. I'll either use a popsicle stick or my burnishing tool to press the wire into the gap. So that will be sufficient. Just make sure when you put your wire in that it's underneath the level of the glass. For really small gaps like this, I'll just take a tiny bit of foil tape and crumple it up and stick it in. So now we're about to start the final steps of our stained glass window. We have the soldering, the patina, and then the polishing. There are various types of solder on the market you should always use a stained glass solder. The differences in the solder depend on the percentage of lead and tin. The most common solders are 50-50, which is 50% lead and 50% tin, and 60-40, which is 60% tin and 40% lead. The two main differences between these solders are their melting point and their cost. 50-50 solder melts at a higher temperature and it also costs about five, six dollars less. Generally when I start my project, I'll tack my glass with a 50-50 and also fill in any gaps. The reason why I fill gaps in with the 50-50 is it has a higher melting point, so there's less of a chance for my solder to leak through the bottom of my project. 60-40 takes a little bit longer to solidify, which lowers the chances of rippling or imperfections in your project. If you wanna just get started, the best choice is to go straight to 60-40. For the sake of the video, I'll be using 6040 for my entire project. There's tons of options and price points when it comes to purchasing a soldering iron. When purchasing your solder, make sure that you get a soldering station as well. You can get them for roughly $15 and they'll prevent you from burning down your house, which is a good idea. The soldering station I have has an adjustable temperature, which allows me to manipulate the heat if I'm going to be doing something more decorative or if I'm working with different types of solder. It also comes with a sponge. This allows you to clean off your tip as you're working. Another necessary purchase is flux. Make sure that you get one that's meant for stained glass. Along with the flux, you also need flux brushes. These are special brushes used to apply the flux onto your foil tape. It's a good idea to have ventilation in your workshop as well. If you don't have a way to ventilate your spot, you can purchase small desktop ventilation systems, which will suck out all of the bad stuff that you don't want in your lungs. Rather than explaining my process, I'll video what I'm doing, and then I'll speak out my thoughts as I'm working. Enjoy. So we're gonna start tacking our project. All you have to do, pretty easy process. I don't like using a lot of flux. People like using a lot, and I see them smearing it around in it. Drives me crazy. All right, so what we're gonna do is that every joint, there's a lot of joints here. 
but at every joint we're just going to put a bead of solder to hold everything in place. Make sure all your pieces are pushed down. I only do a few spots at a time so I can keep track what I flux and not. What I like to do is I'll just put the wire down. All right, and I like a high bead. So I'll do that and I'll, I'll move it around. When I tack my pattern, I like to bring out a little bit of the solder along the edges so they're easier to connect and it becomes seamless. So I'm going to walk you through soldering now. All right, when I have a big panel like this, I actually like to just tack a few areas and then solder it and then move on to a new section. That way I can just keep track of what I'm doing. So I'm going to walk you through my process. The first step is to tack. I like to look at these as almost pit stops. I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Any areas with large gaps that I have a filler in, I'll make sure to get the solder in at the joints pretty deeply. And then I'll go over it again for my final pass. This way I can keep a consistent bead. I found for the best results is to have the longest stretch of line possible. All right. So what I'll do is I'll do this line first. Depending on my angle, I'll either have my solder underneath or on top. For right now, I'm going to have it underneath. So I put this, this is why I call it a pit stop. I kind of re-wet the joint. And I try to keep making my way in. Trick is this being consistent. And then here's the joint. Okay, so honestly this looks pretty good, but it's not exactly to my liking. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go over it again with just a little bit of flux, not too much. You don't want it to bubble up too much. If your solder is bubbling up a lot, that means you put too much flux on it. If you stay in one spot too long, you could crack your glass, but it also creates ripples in your solder. So you want to always be moving as best as you can. See, there's a nice line along here like this. So I'm actually going to bring it, the solder from here, and move it all the way through here. All right? And I see that there's quite a bit at this end, quite a bit of solder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this, my solder away, and then bring 
this solder out along the joint. You'll see what I'm doing in a second. So now I pull it away, bring it in. I'm going in at an angle again. I'm gonna try to quickly pull this through as smooth as I can. And then bring it up to that joint. You'll see it dries quite nicely. There's quite a bit of solder here. I don't really like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up this section and then just pull out like that. I'm going to do it again and just pull out. Be careful because there's a lot of solder at the tip. I'm just going to thin it out. All right, so over here now, this looks pretty bad. It's going to come around here into this. So what I'm going to do going to reapply a little flux thinking if I'm going to go this way or this way I'm going to go this way I'm going to heat this joint up and so when it pulls and then I'm just going to pull it the pull over to thin out some of that solder over there I'm also going to put it down at an angle a bit of an angle like that I'm just going to pull it and then over here Add the solder. I just want to stay as consistent and smooth as possible. I'm getting to this joint. I'm going to pull it all the way through the joint. Like that. And it leaves a really nice joint. That's how you get good joints. Is by pulling it through. All right, it's, it's all about your planning. So I have this section here. I'm actually just going to start the section here. And bring it up and then bring it back down, and then pull it through this way. So bring it here. Pull it like this. Keep pulling, and pull it out. All right, over here is like a little messy, and this is bare. So I'm gonna put a little flux on it. I'm going to take a tiny bit of flux, uh, solder, just like that, and pull it through. So here's a good line. It's going to go all the way down here and around. I'm going to get to this joint right there, so I'm going to actually have to tack that. There's a tiny piece of filler in there, so I'm just going to make sure it's well fed so it doesn't mess with the flow of my bead. Once again, consistency is the trick to getting a smooth bead. You just want to be as consistent as possible. Ah, that's tough. pull it off okay that was pretty good and it's pretty smooth right here over here is really messy so what I'm gonna do so I'm going to put the flux there and then I'm actually just gonna pull it through the joint and start up here I'm actually gonna put a decent amount on and just allow it to pull itself in Come around to this joint, heat it up a bit, and pull it through. This spot, I know there's filler underneath it. It's not so pretty. So I'm going to actually put a little bit of flux on that. I'm going to fill this gap. There's a tiny gap. It's not such a big deal. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hold my iron a little bit above this seam so that it actually builds up on top of the solder and then I'm just going to move it around and then come down this way. Actually I'm going to move it and pull through first and then I'll come down this way and pull through on that side. So I'm actually holding my iron a little bit above it. 
I'm just pulling through. For this side, I'm just going to run it down here and pull it through again. Just pull it through. These little beads will come off, you don't have to worry about that. Alright, same thing with this one. So I'm actually going to stop. I'm going to put this flat down the edge of my iron right at the end of that joint and then try to lift it up right here so that way I'm basically cutting off the joint and adding on to it and then lifting up like that so it just gives you nice clean joints All right this is a straight line straight shot so I'll be doing that next To it. So I think of my joints as pit stops. They kind of assist. It's like a gas station. They kind of assist with my uh, my solder, so I don't have to worry too much about when we get to joints. Because generally, there's a crack in a joint, and the solder seeps in, and then it's hard to maneuver your iron. Alright, and then this one, I'm going to start here and I'm just going to pull it through on this. This purple glass is a little bit tricky to solder. It's super textured and taping it was a nightmare. Kept tearing. That's why this is like this, is because it kept tearing and I just kind of gave up on it. Figured no one's going to notice, except you and me. So this is a pretty hefty joint right here. So I'll bring the solder in and then right when I get about here, I'll stop and then I'm just gonna pull it through onto the glass. Keep moving. You wanna try your best never to stop. For the sake of the glass and also the joint. Let's pull that through. Trying to move fast. All right, so I just washed. I just washed all of the flux and the spatter off um, outside. It was raining, so I didn't want to film it. But basically, all I did was use some Dawn dish soap and a scrub brush like this, and just scrubbed it down, cleaned up any of the edges with an X-Acto knife if I saw any parts, and um, just wiped it down with a soft cotton rag and made sure it's completely dry. The next step now is to patina the solder. The first step to patinaing is actually using some steel wool. I have quadruple zero steel wool. All we're gonna do is we're gonna rub down all the soldering joints with some of the steel wool. What it's gonna do is it's gonna scratch the uh, surface, which will allow the acid to seep in. You'll see it buffs the solder out really nicely. Once you're done buffing out the solder, I just take my brush, try to get off 
little fragments of the steel wool. So this is the patina I use. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour it on to the window in a few places. Honestly, if you have a little squirt bottle, that would work great too. All right, and then with my brush, I'm just going to circulate all the patina. You don't want to leave the patina on too long because it will stain your glass. So I like to leave it for roughly five minutes. And then I'm gonna take this outside and rinse it off. So I'll let this sit for five to 10 minutes and then I'm gonna take it outside and I'm just gonna rinse it off with cold water. Just outside sprayed it with a hose actually, just cold water. And the last step is now to polish it. So you wanna make sure it's mixed up really well. I use Clarity Stained Glass Finishing Compound. Just wanna take a soft rag like a t-shirt, something cotton. I just squirt it on like that. That should be plenty. Just want to work around the seams and get all the spots. Even if you don't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. This is plenty for the entire window. If you want this to speed up the drying process, you can actually, um, it says you put a heat lamp on it, or you know, put in front of a heater, small space heater, that will speed it up. I'm also not moving my rag. I'm keeping my rag in one spot, so that way it's not absorbing all the wax. Looking at the reflection in the light to see if there's any spots I missed in the glass. All right, I'll be back in about 45 minutes to an hour. So this is what it looks like when the wax sets up. It gets white, so we're ready to buff it off. Just gonna use a cotton rag. So here's the final project. The glass is actually hung over a cavity in a wall and behind it I projected some LED lights that have a wave pattern and it's neat because it has a bunch of different color options and everything and it's also remote control so you just point at it. I'm very happy with the way it came out. Now I'm turning off the lights so you can see without the, uh, the box lights. So it came out pretty cool. So I made the frame as well. The frame is using a technique called intarsia. It's out of poplar and uh, I sprayed it uh, black paint and then polished it out with some steel wool and uh, furniture wax. Uh, the customer was super happy and I, I absolutely loved the project as well. I couldn't be happier. I hope you guys learned a lot from this video and please give me a thumbs up uh, if you liked it and subscribe. I'm only putting out high quality videos and I hope you can learn from my uh, process and I'd love to hear comments as well as any tips or tricks to improve my process or yours. Let's learn together. All right, thanks guys, and have a good one.